All right, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We've got a great event tonight. We're going to be talking a little Old Crow, the very historic brand. We're going to be doing some taste comparison as well. We'll uh, taste some modern day Old Crow versus this bottle that I uh, got here and had uh, shipped back over from Europe uh, from the 1970s, which should be very cool. I'm very interested to see how the taste compares today. And then also joining me is a, a legit old crow fan in miss becca sue so she is going to be talking a little bit about why she loves old crow and uh, when i met her uh, i think she had two bottles of bourbon one of them was old crow and that was her favorite one to go out to the bar uh that, that she was notoriously love those two dollar pours at her local bar so that's i think how she became an old crow fan but uh it was definitely one that she always had with her as well uh with that of course we've got uh from jim beam the current uh, stewards of that brand. They, of course, weren't with it when it started, but uh, they've had it for quite a while now. And uh, we've got Mr. Freddie No here. Freddie, how you doing, man? I'm good, Steve. I'm good. How are you doing tonight? Ah, doing very good as well. Yes. Going to be a fun event. It should be an interesting tasting as we compare uh, today's Old Crow versus something from the 70s. Have you tried a bunch of different eras of Old Crow, Freddie? I'll be honest with you. So we've been procuring some, but... With this new craft distillery coming online, we've got um, a fellow by the name of Jim Kokoris, um, who worked very closely with my grandfather, actually did a lot of media training for my father and myself, and traveled with dad as well. Um, he's been doing a little bit of what we, he, I guess he's kind of retired from the, <clears throat> I guess, marketing side of things, and is doing what we're calling a heritage, uh, <laughs> heritage management, I guess is what he's doing. And preservation, essentially. So we, I, you know, I don't, you may have heard me say, I know I've said it directly to you, Steve, we sucked at, at keeping notes and, and keeping items and things, you know, granddaddy liked to give them to anybody that come over. If, if somebody stopped in and, uh, you know, become a buddy of him, he, he'd, you'd leave with something, you know, who knows what it might be. I met a fellow actually in Japan um, who actually left with one of these bottles. So, it's called the Pendennis Club. It's a Jim Beam bottle that it was actually the the oldest known bottle that has Jim Beam on it, and it and it was bottled for the Pendennis Club in New York City. Wow! And so we had Granddaddy had one, and Dad told me this, you know, because we've been they bought one actually recently, pretty pretty high dollar. I can't recall what it ended up going for, but they bought it because it was the only other known one. So I'm in Japan with Greg Davis and this fellow, uh, he's like, we got to come meet this guy. You got to come meet this guy. So I said, all right. So it's this bourbon bar right here in Japan in the middle of, I mean, it's a knife. You would think it was plopped in America. Just so much bourbon, old bottles, old, a lot of old crow, uh, actually memorabilia from the seventies. Um, and, and this fellow, I can't recall his name, but his last name's Rosian. And he's a very avid bourbon guy. So I get to talking to him and my grandfather had been to this bar and my dad had met him in Japan, but this fellow had came to Kentucky to learn about bourbon in the, in the late, late eighties and early nineties because he was intrigued by it. And when he met my grandfather both times and the second time he actually gave him the, the family's last known bottle of this Pendennis club whiskey. So, we're not very good at uh, <laughs> keeping, keeping archives. So we've got a fellow doing some of that and he sends me photos of bottles and he's been procuring some. And I was actually just talking about a couple of new processes I want to trial out. And it's got some related old whiskey to it. <clears throat> and I told my, my supervisor, I said, you know, you've been procuring all this damn whiskey and I ain't seen the first drop of it. <laughs> right. Somebody's, I don't know. I hope, I hope it's somewhere in a safe keeping, but there's quite a bit of money that we've dropped recently in procuring some old bottles of whiskey. Um, I'll be, to be honest, it's been a few old crow, a lot of old overholt. Uh, I'm just kind of looking for some variations of rye. And uh, we've been working with a fellow who's got a, a lot of knowledge on that, but yeah. So, uh, and beam and, and, and other things as well, but, a lot around the, the kind of olds, as we call them, the old granddad, the old overholt and, and old crow, um, mainly because we don't know a lot about them. You know, we inherited these brands and in, in 1987, we picked up uh, what I was just speaking of their old granddad 
and Old Crow specifically from National Distillers. And honestly, up until probably three years ago, we didn't have a lick of information from back then. You know, some of the folks that had worked there, um, you know, I don't, they never came to work for Beam in the dis distillation side of things. Um, the, the bottling side, they did keep on, but a lot of them didn't know much about the process. So there was a lot of things when we picked these brands up that we really got lost in translation. <clears throat> and then about three years ago, they were cleaning up the Frankfurt plant and found an archive. And it's funny, I actually was asked about this this morning. I can't find my copy of this thing. But there was a digital and then a, a hard copy. This fellow found a bunch of old labels, basically a bunch of, I guess when they ran the first runs of some of these products, Old Hermitage, um, which has some kind of ties into, into Old Crow. Um, they would, would save these, I guess. And he found this archive of these labels and some mash bills and such. There was no Old Crow mash bill in there. So really what we had picked up the old granddad mash bill and that was essentially the only mash bill that they gave us to distill. So when this was uh, procured by us, it was utilizing old granddad and across uh, our time frame. to be transparent, it's, it's been utilizing from the Jim Beam mash bill. Uh, and I, I'm sure it was a phased approach away from, from the old granddad into the Jim Beam. Uh, but, but yeah, so we didn't inherit a lot. And then I found, like I say, a, a fellow found some archives in a room they hadn't cleaned out in, I guess, forever. And there was quite a bit of, there was probably 13 mash bills on this list, maybe a hundred and 150 labels at probably, maybe not 150, hundred to probably 100, 120, probably labels, um, old marketing ads, things like that. Um, None of it really referencing a lot of what I wanted to see, you know, more detail of the, of the process and what they inherited, um, you know, why, you know, what makes Old Crow really intriguing to me is the, the sour mash process and Dr. Crow creating that. And really, you know, for me, I, I look at it as what Old Crow, you know, has become. It's not much of a, of a good representation of what it was. And I've actually had conversations about mm -hmm. that with my boss and some others. And, you know, again, for me, it might, might shock some people, but I, you know, in my opinion, I would probably pull old crow off the shelf and, and have a go at rebranding it and coming back with something that, that represents probably Dr. Crow maybe an ode to the process to give you a little bit of a teaser of what I'm thinking about. Mm. Ode to that, uh, you know, original sire mass process. But, um, you know, just given the, the volume of, of sales that it does and, and the story that it could be telling, I think it would be, um, you know, I, I was, I'd seen some labels in there. Honestly, <clears throat> there was a, a label for a 21 year old and someone had released. Wow. Some, but there had been a 21 year old. <laughs> Uh, bottling of, of old crow i think it was a very limited run from what this fellow who was a pretty uh, big um historian of the frankfurt area um he had said that too that it was kind of a special thing someone had done um, i can't recall you know there's a lot of that that brand changed so many hands i guess from from distillate from not distillate from distiller um you know to, to kind of look like what we are custodians essentially of these brands changed hands so many times at one point it was you know the, the the main dog the number one bourbon and somewhere between um the the 50s and and when we picked it up it really had something they had done to change that whiskey and it wasn't much even when we picked the brands up so um, i think there's a lot of of interest to me in telling and preserving a story you know i'm i'm very big into the history of bourbon and the history of a, the whiskey made in America should be the foundation of where whiskey and bourbon goes. Um, and this brand, or, or for me, representation of a person as well, um, deserves probably a little more credit than we've given it. And <laughs> yeah, like I say, I, I kind of feel bad about that. Um, obviously, to, 
to defend myself, I inherited a little bit. Of <laughs> right. It, but, uh, but, but even at that point, we as you, a company you, inherited. You, you were five. You were five when Beam acquired. This. So it's not like uh, not like anybody's pointing a finger at you here. So, so. so yeah. yeah, you know, I, I look to, to hopefully give some spark and life into it. Uh, you know, bring it to, like I say, do you, do you look back at history and see what, what it was standing for before? That's kind of what my point is. You look at it and see what was it standing for? What was the whiskey story? Really? Not, not what was the whiskey standing for at that time? Um, and then maybe we can re reinvigorate some of that and, and get a, a good story around Dr. Crow or yeah. Or Crow. Freddie, I think there's no greater uh, testament to exactly what you're saying than Dr. Crow himself. I mean, if you go back and look, he's one of the most important people in the history of bourbon. The first person to bring science to bourbon, doing pH and keeping notes about all these things and using, uh, you, know, you know, not just guessing about the proof, actually, you know, using uh, techniques and tools to, to measure that. Uh, the first person to do all this. And you know what? He did this all in Kentucky and he's not in the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. So that, that shows you how, how I think the brand reflecting on him exactly has, right. as you know, they had, because they go back and they get people from history and grab them yeah. in the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. How's Dr. Crow not in there? I agree with you. I mean, all of my ancestors are in there and, you know, I mean, like, for instance, like David Beam, uh, Jacob Beam started it. David Beam was his son. He essentially stayed there right where his dad distilled. And, and, and really didn't grow it too much, just maybe another 200 acres. Um, not, a, not, you know, probably wouldn't be one of the more prominent names if you ask me of the, of the top of the, the, of the pile of all family and he's in there. So I agree with you. It, it is definitely a reflection of the brand kind of reflecting back on the man. That's why I brought that up. It was funny because um, <clears throat> in this meeting I brought up, you know, reinvigorating old crow and, and in the short term, maybe pulling it off to get separate. I guess my point is in my head, I get to a place where if you release a 21 year old old crow right now, what would that really, you know, how would that sit? Where would, you know, <laughs> there's a big disparity between what your Huge. base is and what you're, you're, you're releasing. So to me, I would want to pull out some of the, the maybe negativity or at least some of the, uh, uh, the notion of what it is now um, for a bit and then come back with something that maybe has a better representation versus just trying to kind of drop something in there. And everybody kind of looked at me crazy because they know how strong I am about preserving history and keeping these brands that we have alive and how we can push all of them forward, not just certain ones, you know? So um, I don't know. We'll see what happens with old crow. It's, it's an interesting brand for us because as you say, it's when we inherit. And so when people come to talk to me about it, sometimes I feel like they think that, um, and I mean, I guess if you tell me, would you, if you had to get rid of, of Baker's or Old Crow, which one would you get rid of? I mean, hands down, I'd, I'd be honest with you. I'd say I'd have to get rid of Old Crow with Baker is such a prominent person in our family, you know, for James B. Bean, you know, right, not right. saying, um, but so, so yeah, so it, I try to te teach these people and talk to these people about these brands of, you know, we're custodian of, of the whole history of, of bourbon, in my opinion, given our, our roots back to the beginning. So it, it's not of, of, of our good nature to disregard these, these brands, especially as we, we call them the olds, the group of the olds, the old overholt, old crow and old granddad, because they kind of sit in a weird place. They're, on our brand, you know, obviously under James B. Beam, as we're calling our, our distillery now, but they were inherited in, in the 80s. So people, um, there's just not a lot of, of drive to, for people to see the deep history. They look at the short-term history of what we've had it as versus what, well, what was Old Crow, you know? Um, so I'm trying to, to educate people and hopefully it can be a better representation of Dr. Crow and the process because what he did to your point he brought science to it but he also brought consistency to me mm -hmm. and you know another thing about about the process that he brought that we reap the benefits of is is with that consistency you know we're not using enzymes or or uh, man-made yeast so 
our process is totally natural. You know, the form of, of sour mashing that we're doing is allowing us to preserve that, that, that environment that our yeast loves to live in. So when we're running consistently, um, you know, I, and it's funny, I've been in these conversations with production. We've had an expansion at Boston and to be honest, it hasn't gone as great as the world would probably like it to have gone. And they keep pushing on these, these issues. And I say, look, you need to run this thing. A distillery runs when it's running. If you're going up and down, up and down, it's inconsistent. And what Dr. Crow did was, you know, even with, with water mashing, you can't, uh, there, you know, there's some science to it now that you can run consistency, but running a natural process with water mashing across time, you will have a very tough time keeping a good consistent product, in my opinion, based on what I've seen through our water mashing processes. Mm -hmm. So this process over time, it, for us is what for specifically, the use of sour mash or setback as we call it. Um, and, and again, it's a different form than what Dr. Crow was doing, but this, this process to me, it untaps some, some untouched yield. There's some residual starch that can always come back. There's definitely residual sugar that comes back and starts to, to almost compound in your system and beefs your system up when you're running very well and consistent. So and I trace a lot of that detail back to Dr. Crow and seeing that, that these yeasts in this area were, I guess, prone to grow in this environment. And I think that's what he was, was setting out to do when he started using Sour Match was get a, a environment conduced for the growth of, of yeast or, or, you know, for fermentation, I guess, more specifically. Um, and I think he did a good job. I, I, you know, it's crazy to think that that process uh, still exists. This was what I think 1838 when he kind of started working on that. Some people say that Catherine lady created it in 1818, you know, I, whatever, if it, that's true, it's true. But, but I never heard that until very recently. So um, anyway, either way, you know, this process, if you're tracing it back to that time frame, to still be so prominent in the process today, uh, to your point, see, this guy is a is a strong figure or pillar, I guess, as I would say, a strong pillar in the foundation of, of bourbon that yeah. we know today. Yeah, he's he's one of the guys that, uh, you know, uh, the individuals from the history of bourbon, when you're talking about the Mount Rushmore, when you'd have to narrow it down to four people, he's in that discussion. I don't know if he makes the top four, but he's in that discussion of right. individuals that could potentially be on the Mount Rushmore bourbon. He's just that that important for sure. The, the brand itself is cool. It's fun. Obviously, they were big into marketing and branding. They're, they're truly the first brand of bourbon. The first, you know, uh, bourbon has been around longer than than old crow but the fact that that people were asking calling it for it in the bar by name uh it was the first because before it was just a commodity really you ship uh you make it by the barrel you sell it and people just ordering you know whiskey or bourbon uh if, if they even called it bourbon then uh, but when old crow came around people started asking for that specifically by name so change things yeah i mean you know even ours you know we started talking about the name old tub but you don't see the you know, you, you talk to people that some say that it was that for some time. Other, some say it was old Jake's whiskey. I don't believe that. I think much like what you were saying, probably when Jacob was doing it, it was more of, um, like you say, a commodity. And, mm -hmm. and people were saying, hey, when that guy comes, I like that whiskey better. Right. You know I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't, wasn't that it was old Jake Beam. I seen somewhere someone said, old Jake Beam sour mash. I said, on a, on a marketing <laughs> thing, I said, well, that's not even possible because Jacob Bean passed away before um, sour mash process was even created. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, that's not true. They're like, well, oh, Jake Beam. And I was like, that's, that makes, that makes sense. That, that's, that fits what you want it to be. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. I, like, I don't believe that. It's not probably what it was. And so the first naming of ours was, was old tub. As far as I know, everybody can dial a debate with these, some of these folks, but, it was old tub essentially. And uh, much after that, I, that I know of after old crow. So to your point, it was probably the first kind of real brand or, or, or 
you know, because it wasn't Old Crow Distillery, I guess. I, you know, the name no, of the no. distillery. So, no, but, yeah, the, yeah, it was just brand. I, yeah, there's no mm-hmm. other way to cut it. It was just first brand. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and they remained uh, obviously, you know innovative i mean i always love and i think they're way ahead of their time with that traveler bottle i feel like the traveler bottle should be brought back and used today oh, yeah. because it was meant to pack in your luggage now I, i'm of the age when i would fly with bottles i'd pick up bottles and bring back i always brought that in my carry-on because i didn't want to leave the bottles in the in the bag but those were the those traveler bottles were made to because they're flat and th- extra thick so, so they wouldn't break inside your luggage and it seems like today when you have to put it in your checked bag it seems like the traveler bottle would be something that uh, people would love today i mean so they were just ahead of their time with a lot of things you're absolutely right they you know well again at one point they were the world's number one selling bourbon and a lot of it probably has to do i mean a the whiskey was good and then b to your point their marketing was very coy and very um I guess spot on with, with, with the, the time frame. you know, if you look at when those travelers were coming out, flying planes was, was really kind of becoming the, the hip thing to do. So mm-hmm. uh, to your point, they were very much, you know, with, I, kind of with the norm, you know, they, 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 it was the hip brand. It was the brand that everybody ran, you know, it, it, it's, in a sense, it was the Jim beam of that, of that time frame. It's, right. Right. I've asked dad even, you know, and he doesn't know much about it because when we purchased this, it, he had been working there about three years. Uh, he said the first first recall I have of, of the National Distiller purchase was they sent me up there because they were having uh, label uh, inventory issues. And, you know, I run a tight shift down here at our shipping and, and receiving label department. So they sent me up there to, to help them sort out their problem. And he said, those people didn't like us when the, the beam people coming up there and working with them, they were very abrasive to it. They didn't <laughs> like it. He said, I didn't go back for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so he didn't know much about, you know, any of the, the national distiller stuff because he had that, that kind of run in there. And, and like I say, he was on the other end of the process for a lot of it. And then when he did get down into the distillery, you know, it was just kind of embedded into our process. So yeah. I'm anxious to try this whiskey here tonight and, and hopefully in the future, try some of the stuff we've been procuring to get a better sense of at least what the flavor is. And then as we start to maybe mess around in this craft distillery, you get a chance to, to maybe tap back into to something or if you see something that pops out, maybe we get to a place where some flavor uh, can come back from from some of these old bottles. That's that's what I'm interested to see. Yeah. W- one last question, Freddie, and it's about the 1969 Old Crow Chessman because a lot of people will say that's the greatest bourbon that's ever been created. And um, you know, hey, I'm, first of all, I want to ask if you've tried it, and then you know, it's in that discussion. A. H. Hirsch, you hear, or or, or Old Crow, and those, those are the and the, you know, uh, I don't know what else would be in the mix. I mean, so it's it's an elite company, that's for sure. I have not, but I've heard a lot of people talk about that. And honestly, one night, one of our ambassadors talked about it so much, I was starting to salivate. And then I finally told him, like, you got to shut up about that. Man. <laughs> Unless you've got a bottle of it, I don't want to hear any more about it. You know, it's like, God, right. man, you got to try this. You got to try this. Um, so, no, I have not tried that. Um, yeah, we we got we got to come up with one of those. I'm always on the lookout, and uh, I've got some friends that are really good at tracking things down. So if we can get some, we'll uh, we'll get a sample your way, and uh, I'd love to have you try that. Mine right, mine mine is now empty, unfortunately. It's empty, of course. Well, yeah, that tells us no good, David. Nothing. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> David's not one of those friends that's going to be helping us. No, no, he, he's not. He's not the guy. No, he's, he's not, not the guy. No, yeah, that's he can show us one. empties. Yeah. yeah, here you go. This was so good, Freddie. It was delicious. So <laughs> Turn that one to a line. Add to that list of of comments that again I still haven't tasted it. So, okay, there you go. I think Miss Becca Sue has some samples because I've always I, given her I some, still, and I, yeah, I think she I does. Still got those, Steve. For, even from the very first one that you sent me, I still have. A yeah. little bit left, and then you sent me a second one because I loved it so much. Right. Um, and so I've so got there you go. two <laughs> little sample bottles of it, um, but I am willing to share. There you go. So, so Miss Becca <laughs> Sue has tried Kevin, something that Freddie knows not. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> no, no, all there is to mention is this. 
1967 Jim Beam that was in the Alaska decanter. Wow. Nice. 1967 Alaska. Okay. That's cool. That That's one. very cool. Yeah. Uh, that must have been the year for states because I have a 67. Uh, I've got uh, several of them. As a matter of fact, I've got one for you, Freddie. I've got uh, oh, Kentucky. The, the Kentucky, the one that says the bluegrass state. It's uh, it's cool. So I will be, I'll be bringing that to you next time we hang out. If you All can right. see it now, here's the, uh, the decanter. The Alaska one. Okay. That's a cool one. Yeah. 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 Very cool. All right. Um, I think, Miss Becca Sue, I'd like for you to lead us on the, the modern tasting. So if you guys want to pull out your, your bottle that says 2020 Old Crow, um, that's the one we're going to try first because that's our, that's our this, control. That's this will be, be the finest thing you taste this evening. <laughs> we hope not. Hopefully, I haven't tried uh, tonight's offering, so I like to try it with you guys. So. But Miss Becca Sue is famously a fan of Old Crow. I, I, I know you were having some connection issues and you were dropping on. Yeah, off. I sorry if you about heard, that. I was talking about that at the beginning. The fact that you are a legit Old Crow fan. Uh, when we met, I said you had two bottles and one of them was Old Crow. She's also a legit drunk. So I go. <laughs> that's that's hey, her it, husband, Roy me, Steely. It's, it's me and all of my, uh, my 87-year-old uh, alcoholics that we just go and hang out in the... Uh, liquor store and buy ourselves some old crow so frankly oh. freddie's saying that he's gonna he wants to pull them all there may be another type of uprising happening in the world <laughs> if that happens and I, i'm just i'm just throwing it out there miss becca sue and a bunch of 87 year olds as she's just <laughs> that would be a tough group to deal with yeah and, pretty quick yeah I, i'm just i'm just putting the warning out there okay all right all right you got your 2020 there too freddie I got it right here. Very <laughs> okay. All right. All right. What do you guys get on the nose on this one? I think you get that peanut brittle, kind of like you do in a lot of the Jim Beam stuff, almost. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think I get just talking process wise for us, the difference in Oak Crow, uh, we, we pull a little bit different of a profile than what we do for Jim Beam. As I said, the majority of this is coming from the Jim Beam mash bill, obviously, today. Um, Mm -hmm. We do what we call a vertical cross section on Jim Beam, which is essentially a blend that lands of the entire warehouse that lands just a little bit under center. So just maybe two ricks or two tiers below uh, center is how we profile it. Okay. This one pulls a little bit higher from that warehouse. I think that's, that's where you start to pick up some of that differentiation uh, for me. I, I don't. I would have to go back to our blenders and ask them exactly what they put this profile at. Okay. I would say probably maybe fifth floor, if I had to guess. Back and looking at the the, the graph, but um, again, like I say, Jim Beam coming in that bottom area of the of the fourth floor, uh, bottom bottom tier there is where we kind of aim for. You're getting some good notes on the nose here: honeysuckle, yeah. nutter butter cookies. It, uh, like peanut that. brittle, honey. It's not as bad as everyone thinks it Candy is. Candy corn. I've had, yeah. A lot of people have tried this just because I've talked it up so much, and a lot of them are. I mean, Day, <laughs> Day of the Dreamer Six. She she drinks it's, it exclusively now. It's not as bad as people think it is. Miss Becca Sue. That's everyone thinks it's going to be disgusting. No, but I, no. I mean, I, I've had some other stuff that I can barely. I mean, it is only eighty proof, so like that helps. But I mean, there's some stuff yeah. I could barely even stomach. Okay. Well, let's give it a taste and see what we think here. Yeah, it's nice. For me, it, it picks up a little more on, the, on those notes you guys are calling out that kind of like, I call it like a, a dark, darker sweet color, like, like mm -hmm. the peanut brittle. Uh, like I say, kind of attributing that to, to being a little bit higher. To me, at Jim Beam at this very similar age, just a corn sweet bomb that goes off so i actually like this um pretty well myself it's i would say the it's price a lot of blackberry on the nose there it's gonna be very uh it's all. no so i've got the thumbs up for my husband he said that he doesn't hate this at all and that he would not throw this off of a uh, uh off a balcony like he did some kentucky gentlemen over the weekend <laughs> I think that's a good, that's a good that's review. A good, that's so a good far. time. That's a good time. 
walk in the cabin in Gatlinburg, and this guy standing there with a handle of Kentucky Gentleman. I said, hey, can I see that really quick? And he answered to me, and I just threw it out the door over the balcony. Like, life is way too fucking short for that. I don't need that around here. And he had like a, a bottle of Neely. I would, so. not, I would not throw this off the balcony, though. It's okay. good. Everyone thinks yeah. I've been crazy for years. Pretty good. It's good. good. That is absolutely your tagline. I would not throw this off a balcony. That's <laughs> exactly. That's, it's, it's a, a non-balcony throw. Yeah. It's, oh. T-shirts. I can see it all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't throw this off a balcony. Old crow. <laughs> Old crow. It's kind of like um, a new tagline. When you're eating cracker jacks and you hit that one peanut that's just got a lot of sugar on it and it's just totally over caramel, but it's really nice and nutty and sweet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the best part about this is you can buy it in the store for like eight ninety five. dollars Yeah. <laughs> and it's it wrong. pretty good. You can get a, uh, you know, you can just get a whiskey water in a bar also for, you know, like two fifty. So yeah. it's, a, it's a cheap drink. That's actually, I think it's delicious. Not bad at all. I agree. Mm-hmm. I like it's it. always on the shelf. You don't have to stand in a line to wait for it. That's what right. I like. Exactly. You can stay hydrated without uh, without over drinking. The COVID line to check out. That's the only line you six feet distance to check out. <laughs> Freddie, do you guys have any uh, demographics on how the average age of an old crow drinker is? I, I you know what? I, I looked. I wanted to share some really cool facts with you guys tonight, but to be honest, it's not even on our damn uh, our readout. It doesn't read, read, read it's, eight, it's 87. I know because I hung out there. Yeah. divided by something is probably oh, like probably 70. Hmm. It's, 70. Yeah, it's plastic, but it's plastic to be fair, bottles. Little Book isn't on the list and neither neither was Baker's. So. Okay. No Baker's on there. Huh. Hmm. I could understand Little Book, but Baker's, Baker's in Old Crow. I was a little bit upset. I thought this has got to be on these things. Right. Makers wasn't on the list. Makers, huh? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, I mean, it's good. I mean, when yeah. you factor in the fact of the cost, again, eight bucks a bottle. That's, for $7.50? Yeah. Yeah. You can get a liter for under 10 bucks. Freddie, how the hell do you make money at eight bucks? Exactly. Hey, we don't make much. I'll tell you. <laughs> That's the conversation that always comes up is, why are we selling Old Crow? They yeah. don't make any money on Old Crow. And I'm like, well. Because the people know. want it. That's I don't right. It either. Exactly. I'll tell you Ten what. bucks a liter. I'll tell you Jeez. what, though, Freddie. It does hold up a lot of space on the shelf. So it, it it's there. It's taken up space. You don't have to promote it, advertise it. People, but people know what it is. I mean, it's it's oh, not yeah. a bad gig. So yeah, yeah, I, I could see why you'd want it there. But yeah, you're definitely not making much. There's no way you're you're getting rich no, off no. of old crows. It's there. Lord have mercy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what percentage of the price of a bottle is 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 tax? Half? Over half, actually. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the distributor. Well, three there's, ways with the distributor, liquor store, and yourself. Yeah. Or right. I, in my case, I wish myself, but the yeah. company. <laughs> you guys are probably getting paid the least, least profit wise. The government yeah. makes more than you, oh, the yeah, distributor, yeah. and the liquor store. Yeah. Right. You're on this probably making a, a buck a fifth. What's crazy is in, in this industry is it's almost like one of the only ones where if the cost of something, the, the manufacturer suggested retail price is this. You could just totally disregard it and do almost whatever the hell you want. You know what I'm saying? It's it's, yeah. it's one that there's the biggest disparity, I guess, is what I would say. Yeah. Other than that, that and the, the guys coming door to door selling you things, you know, the MSRP of what they're giving you is always way higher than what you're paying for it. But other than that, it, it it usually doesn't align. But to your point, yeah, we're we're getting the we're getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Let's see what we've got on this old crow. This is uh, on the yeah, on the seventies. Sure this is uh, age stated six years is what uh, six, years. six years is what the bottle says on this one. Freddie, what's current old crow? Are you able to disclose that? It's four. Yeah, it's right four. at four. Four years. Okay. So as I was saying earlier, basically it's it's very similar to Jim Beam. 
Uh, we process it very, very similar. Um, it goes into the barrel at just a little bit different barrel proof. But outside of that, where we, we differentiate as well is just um, Jim Beam comes at just a little bit lower, a little bit under the center cut. This could be coming out of just a little bit above it. Um, and I was actually surprised at how much, again, I hadn't tasted Old Crow in a while, how much that kind of corn sweetness that I pick up on Jim Beam isn't present. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just, just right at four years old. Probably, I'd say probably 50 to 52 months, probably what it's averaging. Yeah. On the nose on this one, obviously way, way different. Oh, totally okay. different. Yeah. Than going wow. On. I was going to say, Becca Sue, you're a little bit, you're going to have to, I, just based off the nose, I'm going to say you're wrong that the first glass is the best glass for oh, you. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll give that to you. <laughs> it's only this once. Only this once. So Ryan says sweet citrus, black licorice on the nose. I was going to say just the, the, the fruitiness that, that citrus comes through yeah. so heavily. Mm -hmm. This is de definitely similar to the, uh, the 69 stuff but it is also obviously different i mean yeah. it's completely different containers and everything in different years but that oldness butter to orange peel that sounds pretty good black cherry or yeah black cherries cobbler mm, that's nice you can yeah. just see the viscosity in the yeah it's just way it's 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 so different isn't it yeah Wow. Yeah, look at the way that just hangs down the glass. Yeah. Amazing. The color this was age, more yeah. caramel too. Yeah. Yeah. I color. see this yeah, being yeah. color's definitely better, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, like we did the old Jim Beam tasting. To me, this is probably one of those where the whiskey that's in this bottle, I'm gonna <laughs> guess is a little bit older than six years old if I mm -hmm. had to stab at it. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> All right, let me give this thing a taste. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, that's good. Mm. Kind of leathery and baked goods and some cherries in there. Yeah. It's really smooth, too. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys yep. remember those orange marshmallow peanuts? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I do pick up a lot of like black cherry. Though. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Peanut marshmallows, yeah. Circus peanuts. <laughs> no, it's funny because I do love circus peanuts, so it would make sense why I love them so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Miss Becca Sue, you have to admit the second class is. It's, it's better. Here. <laughs> but only by a little only by a little okay that's that's really nice i, mm -hmm. I drink that a lot <clears throat> yeah all right bob i'm gonna have to say something i'm disappointed that all night for some reason i thought you were wearing a dale earnhardt hat and i just realized it's not a dale earnhardt hat. <laughs> <laughs> i could barely uh, see it it dipped down and it, it looked kind of like the the symbol of a three and i was like Man. yeah my dad's going to be fired up when I tell him there's a, a guy wearing a Dale Earnhardt hat on. <laughs> <Not ready. No. laughs> yeah, well, there's, there you go. There's, there's the uh, car. Ryan, Ryan's got it. Yep. <laughs> it's a White Sox hat and they actually may be a baseball team this year. Hmm. With our own coach, Tony La Russa. Yeah. 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 Who I think I think was drinking some of the old crow with Becca Sue. <laughs> Among the other guys. things. He might have been, yeah. One of those 87 year olds. It's it's surprising who you meet in the liquor aisle. Yeah. <laughs> Outside the liquor store in Sparta. That's where I pick her up every day after work. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's nice. So you guys can't reverse engineer that or kind of <laughs> do any. We can, there's two things with it. Number one, there's a compound that I, I'm guessing through the glass, I, I'm not sure if it was some kind of coating or something <clears throat> that over time becomes more present in whiskey and it tends mm. to round out 
some of these other compounds that we'd be looking at. The second piece, the, the, the depth that we look at our whiskey today, this whiskey would map very similar to what we have. Um, because what we're looking at is at a, at this point, very kind of broad details of certain things. It's more a sensorial uh, approach to what we do. Now, Suntory, so we look at about 13, uh, 13 compounds. Suntory looks at 120. Uh, we could send it to them, but then again, the big thing there is 13 is probably not enough, but 120 is probably overkill. So how do you replicate that? I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I honestly haven't had a lot of uh, conversations with Suntory since uh, the COVID thing hit. They have a very extensive uh, vintage whiskey collection as well. And I was wanting to work with them on collaborating on some of this stuff. And it, they sent me some bottles that they procured of like Jim Bean Black, which is my dad's favorite. Uh, the original Jim Bean Black from 1976, 1975, uh, 101 month, 90 proof. Mm. They sent me three bottles. I said, hey, you know, uh, or actually, I seen all this vintage whiskey, and, and and I said, hey, you know, we're looking at some of this stuff for some stuff for a dad's kind of legacy product, and getting some inspiration. They're like, what? What did you? What was it that he liked the best? And I said, what it was. And by the time I got back from Japan, those bottles were, were pretty much there waiting for it. So mm. they collect that whiskey, uh, and, and they know, you know, they even uh, share differences in their whiskey processes over time of. You know, taste this. <laughs> this the reason we change this part of our process and things like that. So, hoping to, to tap into more of that, and we could get a very good map of what this whiskey is. Mm -hmm. One piece to it is like ethyl carbamate, which is something we've talked about before, and the regulation of it in today's world. It wasn't regulated then, and we've done some of our tests on on whiskey <laughs> in the world, from, or just like Jim Beam four-year-old and this Jim Bean Black I've talked about. And both of them are almost three times today's legal limit of ethyl carbamate. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. But again, well, and what exactly is that stuff? What is ethyl yeah. carbamate? So yeah. It's a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. A large concentrate of this stuff would essentially make you go blind. Like It's, it's kind of what they would say made you go blind back in the olden days where I guess kind of come up with that term from where oh my God. Gray blindness or at some point it could eventually kill you as well. Uh, we got it. We all, we all got to take up a GoFundMe for Jason Bronner then. I mean, <laughs> talk about a guy who drinks old whiskey. That's this guy. It's, it was known to cause cancer or this, this, this doctor that, that released that study said that it enhances the chances of causing cancer by so many percent. Everybody flipped out about it. Um, <clears throat> essentially it, it in my opinion based on the sampling I've tasted uh, I've never known that you can pick up that as a, a thing. it's almost like an odorless colorless compound for my experience. what's interesting to me is we went to the approach of throwing more copper to the system every distillery essentially did as to how to kind of control that, it's the amount of other compounds that are probably being pulled or drawn down um, that are probably making more altering the flavor than the ethyl carbamate. Uh, hey, well, it's kind of hmm. interesting. I'm in a bourbon tasting. Can I call you back? We say hi. <laughs> no, we say hello. All right. Thank God they got the music. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions for Freddie? We always like to save some time at the end for, for questions for Freddie. Maybe that call in was to Tim. There was a question for Freddie. So that was Junior. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> that 70s old crow is pretty darn good. I like yes, it. it is. Yes, that is some good drinking whiskey for sure. That's some pretty darn good whiskey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially 86 proof. Yep, 86 proof, and that is some good stuff. Freddie, what are some of the drivers that make whiskey from 
and I know we've talked about this on other events, but we have a different group here, you know, you know, something in the seventies, why, why do we have this affinity? Is it just a, a mind thing or, or is there, is there things that really make it I taste different? A little bit of both. I, mm-hmm. One thing that, that I've touched on before is fermentation time in today's world, especially for us, we're running a very uh, steady process that is running 24 seven we run one fermentation temperature. In the olden days, they may shut down, you know, for one day this week, four days next week, two days the week after, and they were setting fermentation and running different fermentation times uh, to achieve those. And, and with that, you get a lot of different flavor of whiskey. Um, you know, some of that stuff that I let, let you and, and Royce taste the other day, that was yep. one specific fermentation. I've got another product that Everything's very identical, is actually identical except for fermentation time was extended for 16 hours. And the flavor development at a, at a younger age goes to two totally different places um, or, or starts to go into different directions. Um, so I, I think fermentation time um, inconsistency probably has a lot more to do with it, you know, um, when we start a cook today, it, we have the steam capability to do that. When granddaddy was cooking and then some of these, these old distilleries as, as whiskey was getting more popular, they were probably pushing to their capacity limits. And when you started a cook, you might have to slow the steel down a little bit to, to, to have enough steam to do both and keep everything moving. So just the inconsistencies, um, I think that coupled with fermentation and then like I said, this addition of copper or addition to areas of process within the bourbon making to control this, this carcinogen uh, probably has what's, what's altered it. So I would say there's probably a little bit of nostalgia there. There, uh, you know, Like I said, if you look at it on our whiskey mapping of today, it's not extremely differentiated. It is differentiated, but not an extreme amount. And right. I, if you taste it side by side, you do pick up quite a bit of difference. Again, do we know this is, you know, if we tasted this next to six year old whiskey or, you know, I guess in reality, if we knew exactly what age this was and we tasted it against whiskey of the same age, um, it probably would still be different. You know, I think that's part of the art of making whiskey is no two barrels are ever the same in my opinion. Right, right. There's that, that art of it, but I think there's just so many different, um, maybe uncontrolled levers that that drove these th- products probably to different areas than than where we're at today, um, and even, you know, some of the things they maybe accidentally tapped upon that created these brands. Um, you know, we've kind of owned our process in to be what it is. So, and I would say most distilleries as they've grown. And size did the same thing. They honed their process in and started to eliminate the variables. I would say that's probably a lot of it is the, the, the variables. And just kind of, you know, nobody used the word blend forever, but essentially when you have a barrel, if one day you're running it and everything's running great, you're hitting your proof off the steel just right. The next day, something's going on. Like I say, maybe you got a steam leak you don't know about or something's going on. You're not hitting proof. I can promise you, you're not shutting down because you're not going to hit the exact proof. You're going to keep on running that damn thing, especially uh, back then when it, they were trying to, to make everything they could. So that that alone right there to me made, you know, hell, there's 100 barrels that were distilled differently. <laughs> and we started blending those back with what you made at what you wanted to make you get something that could be extremely rare and unique like this. That's cool. And probably at the time, people probably saw the, you, I bet you saw a lot more variation from bottle to bottle um, as a consumer, I would say. I would guess so too. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I, uh, I will share with this group too. You mentioned Jim Kokoris and the, you know, the, what he's done working with your grandfather. And we had a show that, uh, is, is not, we don't do it anymore called bourbon history, but we used to do that podcast and I'll send out links. We did two of those with Jim, one with him by himself. 
telling the story of rolling out the small batch, which are some mm. stories of your, your grandfather in there. And then we did another one where we had him and Kathleen Di Benedetto uh, come on and just share stories about Booker. And uh, there's some great stories in there. I, I mean, laugh out loud. You know, your, your grandfather was a character, man. And uh, yeah. they share some of the crazy stories. Mm -hmm. I would have hated to travel with him because he, <laughs> he made me nervous, you know, just sometimes even dad does with what's it would, you know, what's going to come out of his mouth. I'm just so worried in today's <laughs> world, everybody, you know, yeah. hearing him off, of, you know, tell a story and it'd be not perfect, you know, right. politically correct and then it get blown up. Granddaddy was the worst. My favorite one that doesn't get told a lot just because it's not, it's, 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 you know, a little inappropriate. I, I wouldn't say it's inappropriate but PR would. Granddaddy was doing a tasting one night with Jim and Jim would go through Basil Hayden, uh, Baker's and Knob Creek and, and Granddaddy would kind of steal the show and, and you know, you got this guy up there, he, he, you know, he's from, from Chicago. So he's very kind of business-like and, and he tells the story of these three whiskeys from Kentucky and it's kind of funny really. And then you get my Granddaddy up there and he goes and tells this story about bookers and what it's about and the true, you know, kind of essence of bourbon. He just kind of blows this guy's socks off. <laughs> but so he'd be telling his story. And my granddad, he said, he, he, his big quote was, he lost his ass when he got old. He had no ass. <laughs> so he wore suspenders. And if he didn't have his suspenders, his pants wouldn't stay up. Well, he lost. <laughs> um, so he had a belt on and he was up there doing this tasting and his pants fell down. And Jim tells his story, and it's funny. Jim can't hardly tell it without laughing. He said, Freddie, your granddad just kind of looked over at me, didn't skip a beat, kept talking, and expected me to pick his pants up. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's just one of those, you know, it's, Booker expected that. He's like, gosh, damn it, Jim, help me out. I'm trying to tell this story. Just, to, you know, it's the way he went about things. It was so funny. Yeah. Yeah, he, he apparently was nonstop with these types of Jim told one story that I've never heard anyone tell before. And I laughed my ass off when he told this. He, he was at a uh, at one of these tastings in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And as they, they get done with the presentation, all that, and they go to the Q&A part. And, and he says, you know, before we open up to questions, he says, Booker says, I've got a question for you guys. Does anyone else have problem urinating at this high altitude other than me? <laughs> <laughs> she was like what are you doing you can't say that <laughs> why would you ask that <laughs> and i can just imagine him just doing his own thing just up there you know and, and but people loved your grandfather when your grandfather he changed what a master distiller is that yeah. th that tour changed the role of a master distiller uh, they yeah, became not only they became not the person that just made the whiskey but you know the face of a brand storytellers yeah oh, yeah. yeah yeah so great stuff. Great stuff. Anybody, uh, obviously a, a great opportunity here, very small, intimate group opportunity to ask Freddie any questions. Anything yeah, Freddie, thanks for being here tonight, bud. It's coming from such a legacy family. What's one of your uh, favorite stories growing up, uh, you personally, around uh, around everything? Um, I, let's see, growing up around... My favorite stories, obviously, um, would be fishing with my grandfather at the lakes as a kid. But one more is kind of specific. You know, I remember we had this, uh, the 200th anniversary celebration, which I would have been eight. Nine. Um, and basically, they had this big kind of big party for 200 years of making whiskey. And I just remember granddaddy being so excited for this thing and, and it just being this big deal to him so much. And then we, we went down there and it was just a big party. And I just remember how much he cared about people being there and celebrating the 200th anniversary. And I, then at the end of it, he tried to get me to go up on this stage with him and, and do a toast. And I, I wouldn't go, but he was damn adamant that I was going with him. So I, there's like photos of me up there with him and I'm like screaming, bawling, crying because I didn't want to be in front of all these people. But uh, <laughs> the backstory of, the, of it was I actually remember so much about that because really it's one of the things that kind of sparked my interest in starting to understand, you know, what my family was doing, you know, making whiskey. So, because like I said, you know, I, I had been there a lot, but not in a, an environment like that. And, and it just was so important to him 
about this celebration. And now, obviously, I know why it was so important. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd say that'd be one of my favorite. But, but fishing with him, it was always he wanted people to be so interested. He'd make it a game, you know, um, who could catch the most fish. You know, he'd do something for the adults. He'd have one thing. He might have a fishing lure or something for the, if kids were, you know, me or any, and my buddies or his buddies, uh, grandkids were with us. He always just wanted everybody to have a good time. And, and and that was the big thing for me, just being around him. He was just so full of life. It was, it was pretty crazy. Like it was just a walking documentary, just the goofy stuff. That That's would be that him question. talking about telling the, the doctor he had high blood sugar. And he said, doc, I figured out I need to drink more whiskey. And the doctor was like, <laughs> you're crazy. No way. He said, I swear. I, I take a drink of whiskey and my blood sugar goes down instantly. <laughs> and so the doctor said, come on down. I'll show you what happens. So I guess there's some kind of process when you do take a drink, it does lower your blood sugar initially. But then about 30 minutes later, it actually fucking skyrockets. It spikes. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, come on down, Booker. The Booker pours a drink, takes it, you know, and then they do his blood sugar. And, and you know, he's like, I see, told you, told you. And granddaddy's like, yeah, I'm going back. No, 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 just wait. Sit here, Booker. Tell me about your day. And, you know, he goes through something with him and they check it again. And it was like off the fucking charts. <laughs> <laughs> so granddaddy, I mean, he was pissed. Dad said he was just madder in hell because he thought he'd figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey was the solution. I remember him telling my grandmother, who she's still alive, my mom's mom, at, at gatherings for Christmas and things, he'd say, you know, come on, Beulah, I'm diabetic as well. It, it's natural sugar. Whiskey's natural sugar. It's not as bad for you. <laughs> he'd be like, but I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. But he'd always, he'd say, it's natural sugar. It's not, it's not as bad for you. <laughs> it doesn't affect your diabetes as much. So here's my impossible question for you to answer, probably. What is your favorite bourbon? Oh, I, yeah. That's, that's a tough one. I have one, you know, because... Uh, it's probably asking you if you ask me what my favorite food is. My wife's like, "You're the you're the most difficult person ever because you don't have a favorite." But I don't. I if you told me I had to eat fried chicken every day for the rest of my life, I'd be pissed at, to, to a degree. You know, same with bourbon. If you told me I had to drink Jim Beam or Jim Beam White Label, I wouldn't be pissed, but I'd be like, "Man, I don't get to drink these other ones." So with that, I'll say I drink Knob Creek more than the rest. I'll just say that. I wouldn't. Pretty it, good. Oh, I like that, Tim. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I, I lean to Knob Creek a little bit more than the others. Um, probably followed by Jim Bean Black and then maybe Baker's right there, probably mixed in there as well. So I've got a question. Since you brought up Knob Creek, how the heck do, do you have such a stock of amazing? Knob Creek aged 14, 15 years, sold at ridiculously cheap prices for a bourbon that old and great. Well, it sold at ridiculously cheap prices. I would say if you look at our portfolio, you'd probably say that about 99% other than probably <clears throat> Booker's and Little Book, you would probably say the rest of it is sold at, at a discount for its its value. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Knob Creek for sure. What it's good for, I would say. So, you may see some brands that we have and some whiskeys we have coming out push that mark higher. <clears throat> but I can promise you, generally speaking, across the board, our goal, and it's our first family billboard ever, the Beam first ever Beam family ad was <coughs> Beam whiskey, no finer quality or no finer whiskey in all this world, yet moderately priced. And that was the whole point, was to make good, high-quality whiskey and to offer it at a moderate price for everybody to enjoy. So that's kind of been the most, so that's why we have it um, price point wise as far as how we have it we did get into a stink where we lost nine year knob creek as a as a season i don't want to really get in that rabbit hole but to be honest we had a couple of dumbasses go off on their own and make some decisions and when 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 people of of better knowledge value became involved it was too fucking late uh, <laughs> So we had to de-age it. But with that, we were still aging to nine-year profile. That was something my dad was very adamant about. I was very adamant about that no matter what, we take the age off, 
we still have to utilize this older whiskey. So when we took the age off, some of you know, we had took a little hit in sales there, but then by blending to profile for, for the time frame we did, it actually let us grow our stock wider in age versus just being a minimum of nine. We were starting to do use 11 and 12 with eight um, and, and over definitely nothing under the age of, of like seven years, eight months, I think was the bottom nine, bottom line. And we were hitting this nine year profile. So then when we, we push and push and push, we get the age statement back on, all of a sudden you have this capacity uh, that allows you to do a 12 year old release. And then as you see, you know, a couple years later, <coughs> let's do a 15 as well. Um, because of that, that moderately priced, um, you know, it's going to kind of be line price with the rest of the, the segment of, of Knob Creek. Um, and that's, that's where you see it. And yeah, luckily that it worked out well. It gave us the chance to, why it was a, an eyesore for sure. I think it gave us a better chance to get our inventory in a good place and, and hopefully bring value to Knob Creek. I hope by, by asking you like those older expressions and, and like that we're pushing that way versus pushing away from age. So that was, that was a big thing for me is get back to that age statement because it was our oldest age product and it stood for that nine year mark. And it was, that's, it's important to what Knob Creek is stands for. So by pushing back to that, I liked it because it gave me a chance to, to mess with some of the whiskey writers who say we, lie, that we don't blend the profiles. It's almost, you know, now as you hear me tell that story, it's kind of like, I hope hopefully lights are going off of, wow, they were actually blending to a profile and not just saying they were going to hit nine years and putting eight years and six months to give them a, a cap. We were actually blending with, like I say, 10 and 11. Nothing, you know, 12 years old, maybe a couple of times, but generally we were saying that that's eight, eight to 11 year mark in making our, our, our profile. So once it freed up, it gave us the chance to, to commercialize it on its own in, in those quantities. Nice. Awesome. Hey, Fred, Any other questions? About that. Yeah, just, just curious. How's dad doing, by the way, number one? And number He's, two, it's nice to see that you guys still got some call over bookers. And, and while we all missed a fourth edition uh, this year, it's nice seeing that, hey, I still, got, I still got the power over, even though the big company's there, and looking forward to, uh, to seeing what's coming up for 2021. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, a guy who's going to be my manager for this craft distillery, when this thing come out, he said, you know, it's good to see that because I tell people, Freddie and Fred are here a lot to protect the legacy, to, to make sure this vision from a founder is, is living on. And he said, the day that I come to work and see that something that really is adamant on the, this founding vision is not, you know, kind of is shifting away from that, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. So to see that that still in, reigns true today, I'm excited to see. And it, it, it means a lot for me too, because it shows that there's a great relationship between the company and, and our legacy and that they respect what we've done and, and where we've come. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it sucks. We kind of got to that point. We've been teetering on it to be quite frank for maybe a year or so, but the quality was still of par. Um, it just happened that one time that the oh shit button had to get pushed <laughs> and, and <laughs> we pushed it. Um, they, the company come listening. So I was excited about it, but dad's doing good. Um, he's, uh, had some, a little bit of health, health things going on, but he's, he's getting his, he's lost some weight, getting in good health. Um, and then hopefully he's a little bit scared of COVID as well, just with, with some of his risks. But outside of that, He's in good spirits. He does miss getting out and talking to people, um, you know, and seeing people. That's what he loved to do was travel. He liked getting in these different cities and seeing how people in Phoenix, St. Louis, Seattle, where everybody, how they were consuming our brands, what they were saying about other whiskeys they liked. Um, so it kind of come to us, you know, he'd been talking about easing into retirement, but with COVID, it kind of gave him a quick slap in the face of what, retirement's going to look like and at first i'll be honest i think he was having a little bit of deep little he was going into dts of of not being out on the road and you know having that social interaction even myself though it to be to be honest going from traveling and being in meetings a lot with people and then kind of going to switching into being on the phone or you know stuck here 
with my lovely family, which I love, but it gave your mom an interest in, in inside of what retirement looks like. And honey, it's oh, for better yeah. for worse, oh, yeah. but not for either. lunch. Come on, right. you got to get back on the road, Fred. Let's go. <laughs> she didn't like that either. She didn't like it either. So yeah, <laughs> but no, I think everything he's, he's doing good. He's, uh, hopefully here, you know, he's, he's been uh, stepping away a little bit from work. I told him to relax. He gets fired up real quick. I said, man, you need to sit back and relax, you know? <laughs> so um, hopefully he's taking a little break. Um, and I, I told him about getting on some zooms and things. So maybe we can get him on one, one night. He's getting close to his bedtime though. <laughs> this <late. laughs> we, we, we do an earlier start. Yeah. If, if you can get pops to come on. We'll do an earlier start. <laughs> For sure. So maybe if we can talk him into it, I think he'll definitely be uh, he'd be up for it. But like I said, he's he's been kind of focusing on his health. And I like I told him, I said, he gets so worked up about little things. I'm like, man, just let me deal with it. I'll I'll handle it. I don't have to get worked up to to get the point across. I can uh, I can make six or seven phone calls and make other people make some moves. You know, I've I, <laughs> I got a big team now. We're good. He's been kind of stepped away for a little bit, so. Yeah, you know, he comes on his conversation and he calls me after it's over. He gets fired up. I'm like, just relax, relax, enjoy your time. So, absolutely. Well, uh, with that, we're going to wrap up the meeting. And I, yeah, I thanks. I'm, it was great. Thanks a lot. I'm going to stop the recording and uh, we'll say goodbye to Freddie. And I'll hang out a little bit if anybody has any other further questions, anything like that. But, Freddie, as always, thank you, my friend. Really, yeah, it was great. Thanks, Freddie. Really good stuff. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. everybody. Thanks. And thank you, Miss Becca Sue. Thanks, Freddie. Thanks, Freddie. All right. Good right. Glad I could, could join tonight. <clears throat>